We'll start. Good morning, everyone. This is our 9 a.m. adult Bible study for the Boulder City United Methodist Church. And for the next three weeks, we're going to, we are going to study Adam Hamilton's Making Sense of the Bible, uh, Section 1, which is the Old Testament, the New Testament, and then a section talk about que questions about the nature of Scripture. So for many of you, this will be a review um, but for others, um, it may be it may be new information. And I know when I when um, Brian taught this class and this same section, um, and we probably spent I don't know a month or more on it, uh, at least four meetings, maybe more. Um, I learned a lot, and I'm still learning a lot every time I do one of these things. So um, I hope you all will take understand that too. And if if it's repeat. Uh, just re it'll be a refresher and if it's not a repeat great so I do want to open with a prayer and then we'll talk about what we're going to do today let us pray open our ears oh God to what you would have us hear through your holy word convict us and challenge us and comfort us Open our minds to new insights and fresh perspectives about our questions. Open our hearts to moving, to your moving spirit. And in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, we pray. Amen. Amen. So what we want to do today and the goals for the session are um, to be introduced to what the Bible is and is not. Uh, to explore the scope of the New Testament scriptures to get a basic understanding of how, when, why the, the Old Testament books were written and learn how the Old Testament books became to be included in the Bible and to get insights into our Old Testament prophecies and how they're reinterpreted through the lens of the life of Jesus Christ. The biblical foundation for this is in Luke, actually, <laughs> Luke 4, 3 and 4. The devil said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And remember what Jesus answered him? It is written, one does not live by bread alone. And the devil went on to continue to try to tempt him, as you remember from those, that temptation in the wilderness. So I wanted to start, before we do the video, um, oh, I mean, before we do that, Actually, there's a couple other introductory things I wanted to talk about briefly, and that's um, think about, and we, I'm not looking for answers right now, but just think about the one thing or the few things about the Bible that have troubled you, perplexed you, or confused you. And uh, if you don't have your Bible handy, you may want to go grab it, um, because we will be going through the, we will do be going through the Old Testament very quickly, but we will be looking at different sections of the Old Testament. So if it's handy, <coughs> have your Bible fine. If it's if it's on the shelf and uh, away, you don't want to go grab it now, that's fine too. We're gonna, you won't necessarily need it, but it just might be helpful as a reference. And that's good for, frankly, any of our Bible studies is to have your Bible handy. So um, how many people remember the children's song about the Bible? Anybody? Which one? <laughs> Well, the one about B-I-B-L-E. B-I-B-L-E, okay. So let me get to the right screen here, and I will refresh your memory. B-I-B-L-E. So I don't know how many of you remember that song. I didn't, I did not remember it. I remember reading about it in the books, but I didn't remember the song itself, but uh, it's got a kind of catchy tune. Um, what do you think it means to stand alone on the word of God?
And if someone wants to talk, you'll have to unmute yourself. And hopefully that's making the word of God the foundation okay. for everything you do in your life. Okay. Does that mean that um, we can trust and obey every word in the Bible? And this is this is somewhat rhetorical. Okay, you don't have to answer these questions. Think, but it's it's to be thought provoking. And does the childhood song reflect the way you think about the Bible, or is, is there are there so many other ways to think about the Bible? So with that introduction, I'm going to play Adam Hamilton's video. I hope. <laughs> Hi, my name is Adam Hamilton, and I'm the author of Making Sense of the Bible. Over the next few weeks, we'll be reading this book together, and we'll be reading Making Sense of the Bible together. I wrote Making Sense of the Bible because as a pastor, I've had so many people come to me with earnest questions about scripture, things that trouble them or disturb them, or, or maybe sometimes overly simple ways of understanding what the scripture is that leads to trouble when they start reading and trying to interpret it. Now this week, we're gonna start by talking about the nature of scripture and how the Bible came to be with a particular focus on the books of the Old Testament. I love this book. I've read it many times. I read it every morning. I read it every night before I go to bed, but I still wrestle with it. And my prayer for you is that you'll love it too, that you'll read it, wrestle with it, learn to ask the hard questions that are raised by it, and ultimately that you'll be shaped by it every single day. pastors and church leaders encourage you to read your Bible. We ask you to read it every day. We send it to you by email with little passages that we encourage you to take a look at. We give you a Bible when you're in third grade. We, we invite you and tell you that this is a very important part of the Christian life. Read your Bible and then, and then you take the time to read it. And sometimes you read it and, and it speaks to you in powerful and profound and beautiful ways. In fact, I'd say most of the time when we open up the Bible, that's how it works for us. But, but sometimes we read it and we go, I just don't get this. Sometimes it's worse. Sometimes we read it and go, this can't be right. Part of the challenge for us is that sometimes our view of the Bible is overly simplistic. It was shaped, our, our theology of scripture was shaped when we were small children. And then that's pretty much what we've held on to. You know, the B-I-B-L-E, now that's the book for me. I stand upon the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. We learned to sing that when we were little children. But we never, as we grew up, we never really thought more carefully about what exactly is the nature of this book. And how does it function as the word of God? And where did it come from? So I was sitting on an airplane some years ago. And, and when I'm on planes, I'm often working on sermons. Not always, but sometimes. And I'll have my Bible open. And I find this works pretty well because my Bible's open. And either the person next to me says, oh, man, he's got a Bible. I'm not talking to him. And then I have peace and quiet. Or he says, or she says, um, that person has a Bible. And they start asking me questions. And that's good, too. So I was working on a sermon. And there was a fellow sitting next to me. And he leans over. He says, man, I love that book you're reading. I said, me too. I love the Bible. He said, uh, he said, you know, what I find so amazing is that God etched every single page of it on stone tablets. I just think that is unbelievable. <laughs> I said, um, well, that, you know, that was just the Ten Commandments. That wasn't the whole, the whole thing. And he said, uh, oh, I knew that. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I mean, God dictated it to the authors of the Bible. I said, well, you know, now that was true in certain parts of the book of Revelation where God said, take a pen and write these things down. And maybe to Moses when it came to the law, but 
you know, most of the Bible wasn't written by dictation either. We see the character of the authors. We know their names. We, we realize that they didn't go into a trance and start writing these things down. Well, how, how did we get the Bible then, he said. It's a really good question. It's one we want to talk about today. So uh, how did we get our Bible? That's a great question. And, and, and part of what we find when we look at the scripture is we find it is, a, it is a document that was written by human beings who were inspired by God. That's what the church teaches. And, and so when we look at this idea of humanity and divinity coming together in a book, these are both important concepts to grasp. Oftentimes we only look at the divine side of this. It is the word of God. And so we, we only look at it as though God dictated these words, but we often miss out on their humanity. So let's talk about the humanity of the scripture for just a minute. Uh, the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, who wrote those books? And we might say, well, God wrote them, yes, but there was some human author somewhere along the way. And then we say, well, Moses wrote them. Well, that's the tradition is that Moses wrote them. But that's kind of an interesting answer too, because the books, those first five, end with the description of Moses' death. Now, how did Moses write a book that describes his death? There is a place, uh, one of my favorite verses in the, in the Torah or the Pentateuch, the first five books, is where it says it describes Moses, and I love this description of Moses. It says, Moses was the most humble man who ever walked on the face of the earth. I really love that, unless Moses wrote it. <laughs> and if Moses wrote it, then he wasn't the most humble man who walked on the face of the earth. And, and so we realize that somebody's writing these things. And, and you know, mainline scholars who, uh, starting about 150 years ago, began really dissecting the first five books of the Bible using the kind of critical methodology that's used in looking at any kind of ancient literature. And what they found is they found sections that use certain words and grammatical expressions, and then other sections that use very different words and grammatical expressions. And they said, well, it looks like there were two different sets of authors who were writing parts of these, or they came from two different sort of strata. And, and, then, and then there were certain parts of it that looked like they were dated later than, than other parts that were dated earlier. And so they began to say, well, it looks like there's, maybe we think we can identify at least four strata that were, that were or layers of, of this story that were then sewn together hundreds of years after this took place. And when I read that theory, I thought, wow, that's so cool. How amazing is that? That, that these stories were passed down from generation to generation and, and people started to write them down and some started to write them here and some there and somebody came and said, let's sew it all together and make sure everyone gets the whole story. And that doesn't diminish my appreciation for the first five books of the Bible. But for some people, it's very threatening to them to think that Moses didn't write all of these things, including the story of his death. And so we recognize there's a human component in this. And then you have to ask the question, why would somebody take the time to write this stuff down? Well, when you do that, it could have been just a historian who was saying, well, no, I just want to write history. Maybe. Well, then you'd have to ask, well, why are they writing the history? But probably there's an agenda. There's something that they want to communicate. There's some important reason why at this time we're going to sew all this together. And we're going to spend hundreds of hours writing this and capturing it because, well, for whatever reason, whatever the historical context was in which that arose. And, and you get to the Psalms and, you know, the psalmists are writing things like, like, you know, you see the humanity in the Psalms, and the psalmist cries out, How long, O God, will you forget me forever? Did God dictate, dictate those words to the psalmist? Or is the psalmist crying out in pain in some moment where he doesn't feel God's presence? And so you see it's humanity, and that's part of what I love about the Scripture, is it's humanity. I was 14 years old when I first started reading the Bible. I didn't get a third-grade Bible when I was a child. I, I, uh, I started going to church out of curiosity, and because there were cute girls there, and I began... Uh, <laughs> And I began thinking, you know, I wonder what's in this book. And so I got out this book. This is, the, this is the version that my Catholic grandmother gave to our family when I was small. And, uh, and I decided I would read it through. I didn't believe in God, but I certainly was interested in reading Hebrew mythology. And I decided my freshman year in high school at Blue Valley High School, I would read five chapters a night after I finished my homework. And so I began in Genesis. And I found these words were fascinating. And then they were more than fascinating. I began to, I began to feel like, Something was speaking to me through them. And as I continued to read them, I began to feel like I was coming to know that there really was a God who was out there. And I felt God whispering to me as I was reading these words, I know your name, Adam. I know your name. I made you. I love you. You belong to me. You're mine. I got to the New Testament. I started reading the Gospel of Matthew, and I immediately fell in love with this Jesus figure. Mark's gospel. I find myself drawn to him even further, I crushed when he's crucified, wondering if maybe the resurrection story might not be true. I read through the gospel of Luke, and when I get to the end of the gospel of Luke, I get on my knees next to my bed, as many of you have heard me tell the story. 
And I said, Jesus, I want to follow you. I know I'm just a kid. I'm just 14 years old. But everything I am and everything I have, I give to you. I want to follow you. Do something with me. That happened because I was reading this book. It changed my life. I read this book every single day. Every morning I read it. Understanding all of its complexity, recognizing there's places I I disagree with and I struggle with in the text. God speaks to me through it. This pocket testament I wear on my back pocket is shaped just like my backside right there. And and you know, I've told LaVon, I I plan to be cremated when I die. You know, when you cremate me, would you just make sure, I mean, I don't believe in burning Bibles, but would you just make sure, put this with me when you, when they send my body in there to be turned to ashes. Because this book represents my highest ideals, my hopes, and my dreams. The person I hope to be and the person I am today somehow is all shaped by what's in these book, in these pages. I want you to understand and be able to wrestle with the difficult places, and I want you to have a deep longing to open this book up and to read it. Because inside are the words of life. Okay. Um, sorry, I want to apologize to those who uh, got in late because I didn't see you were waiting. Um, I, as I found on the very beginning, when the very first person, which was um, Linda Robertshaw, wanted to get in, uh, I realized I hadn't done a setting right. I changed the setting in the master, but I, by the time I I got to that, we had more people in and I, who I'd let in, and then I would have to stop the meeting and restart it. So. Um, and I also found the recording wasn't on automatic. I had to turn that on. So I got that fixed, um, got the recording going. So anyway, the problem was, I think when I put this together, it was like 10 o'clock at night, that first setup. <laughs> and I was exhausted after a long day, but I knew I had to get it done. So I got it done, but I didn't get it done right. So that's what happens when you're in a hurry and you, you're tired. Or when you're just not paying attention, which it could be the case as well. Uh, everyone is muted, so if you want to talk, you'll have to unmute yourself. I did that because there was some background noise. I wasn't sure whether that was coming from the video or whether that was coming from somebody else's um, back room or whatever. So um, I, I don't think I can unmute. I can't unmute everybody automatically, but I can unmute you. So if you don't can't get in and you can't unmute yourself, raise your hand. And Kim, uh, I know that doesn't work for you because you have a... Um, you have a, um, you're on your phone, I think. So anyway, uh, if you uh, if you have a problem, um, if you, let's see, there's some people who sent a chat. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what Susan meant uh, with your question, why? Um, but anyway, uh, if you have something, you, you're welcome to, unmute yourself Susan and, and join the discussion uh, so I didn't I didn't give you the the uh, hints the, uh, ahead of time the um, the first question we want to discuss was um, the Adam's uh, concept of divinity and humanity of the Bible and your thoughts on that so does anybody want to share their thoughts on on that topic Don't all speak at once. Of course, you're all muted, so. This is Susan. Susan speaking. Before everyone is waiting, while we're waiting for answers, the reason that, that I wrote why is because Linda had written, my three cats raced out of the room. And so I said, why? Oh, okay. So that was to Linda. I wasn't sure whether that was to the question about the Bible or whether that was something else. So I did see Linda's thing. I just... I just thought that was interesting, Linda, but I didn't think it was on topic, so I didn't choose to discuss it. So, um, unless unless they're afraid of the Bible or something, you got your, you're not raising your cats properly. I'll chime in that when people come in unmuted and their dogs are barking in the background, there are consequences for some people. <laughs> and my one cat needs to have her claws trimmed, and so. Now I'm bleeding as a consequence. So thank you to everybody who comes in muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Louie actually is, is laying in his bed. His eyes are sort of partly open. 
Um, we put it, we bring one of those little portable bed things in. in uh, there's a couple in my office already over in the corner, but we put one over right over here beside Pat. So, so Louie and Pat can both um, pay attention to the, um, the lesson. Or maybe Louie anyway, right? <laughs> okay, uh, the next, I didn't, I didn't see anybody else want to talk about that, so that's fine. Um, the, um, also, the, um, Adam observes there's a lot of, a lot of biblical texts that, um, that are confusing, he might disagree with, um, you might disagree with uh, some passages, but the, he says that God still speaks to him through the text. Um, does anybody have a comment they'd like to share about that? Uh, share about your own experiences wrestling with the Bible text? Well, I have a lot of a lot of times when I'm running, when I while I'm in the process of trying to paraphrase the New Testament, I am finding running into a lot of of passages that I just plain don't understand. And so I, I often find myself praying, help me to understand this. And then, the, I, then my mind becomes clear and I understand one, at least one way to, to understand it so I can share with others. Okay. One of the things that I remember from my favorite professor <laughs> would say that before there was the written scripture, there was the community of people. And the community produced the scripture, and then the scripture began acting upon the community. And so it continues on and on like that. Um, getting back to your first question, Scott, about the, the I think Adam really puts it well the combination of the divine and the human, uh, humanity of going into the Bible. Because going in, there are certain sections that yes, I disagree with, I find troubling. Um, and probably that's because maybe humans are having more of a say than God in those places. Yeah, it's it is hard to distinguish between is, is this really God's God's spirit that's moving the the writings, or is this um, a chance to vent or a chance to um, talk ill about a neighbor or something else? Um, I mean, you go through some of the wars that are discussed, uh, some of the other things that happen, some of the other difficult passages. Um, it generally um, the sort of the bottom line you'll get out of this is his. his his book here on uh, making sense of the Bible is, is it, there may be, it may have been inspired. There may have been some Holy spirit at work there. In, in many cases there, there was, but in, in plenty of cases, it was someone recording what was the norm of the time and what was expected. And maybe some of the writers were going against the Holy spirit. Well, that could be true too. Or they may have, they may have been influenced by a different spirit. That Well, that, or, or just didn't agree. But I, I also think too that even today, like our lives are, you know, we, we live by certain customs and norms in our society. And certainly that was prevalent in the ancient world as well. Um, so I just think, like I said, um, I think Adam does a great job. I've, I've read more of the book of putting things together in a way to make it understandable. Um, to show how God and people do work together to bring forth what I think God desires in this world by sharing it through stories. Okay, Rick, did you another, tip, another problem is that I'm sitting here with like five, five major translations of, of the New Testament plus a paraphrase and they don't all say the same things. They are, some of them are actually uh, opposite. They say opposite things. And so it's, that just gives you an idea how difficult it is for people to understand the Bible. Okay. Um, 
Rick, did you have something you unmuted yourself and then you remuted? Did you have something you wanted to add? Oh, I was I was just going to respond to your your original question and that's, and, fine. Uh, that's fine. You can do that. No, I I don't see. I guess I don't see almost how anybody can pick up the Bible and and read read it and not feel like it's talking to you. Um, you know, sometimes I think it's shouting. Um, the um, I think it's it's powerful the way it's written and and following on to what Michael was saying and and then what we read for today um, about Adam Hamilton stating that um, historians seem to be saying that much of the historical part of the Bible was written during and shortly after the Babylonian exile. Um, that, and, and a lot seems to be written by Ezra. Um, is that it, when you, if you look at it from it was written by those people at the time who wanted to interpret what was in the oral scriptures to the times and what the people needed. Um, if we think about the Babylonian captivity and the resettlement of Judah, um, you have to look at all of that was orchestrated by God, right? I mean, it, it all came about because of uh, Judea, Judah's um, disobe uh, disobedience and chasing after other gods and then God having enough and, and then having the Babylonians come in and take them out. Um, and then the 70 year exile and then uh, bringing them back to resettle the land. And as we look at, especially when we read um, from Nehemiah, well, it's not in that order in the Bible, but um, say Ezekiel anyway on um, the, uh, there was much more, much more attention. I, there isn't further, um, further major problems with disobedience after that time. Okay. Um, so I'd like to uh, go to something that um, Adam Adam talked about, but he talked about it so quickly that it was. It, it was kind of hard to get it. Um, so can everybody see this um, Bible overview of the Old Testament? Yes. Okay, good. So that came out of um, um, the Rose Book of Bible Charts, Maps, and Timelines. And it's very similar to the sketch in the back of my book that I did when... Brian put it up on the uh, the whiteboard in the in the um, Smith Building where we had our Bible study. Um, so I just thought it was um, interesting to share the the first part of the Bible being being the um, Pen Pentateuch. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but it's the uh, it's really the um, the sec the the part of the um, the Torah, isn't it called, as part of the Old Testament? Um, and then and then the historical books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, and Kings. And there's different numberings, by the way, the number of books. Um, I believe in the in the Hebrew Bible, they put these the, these together. Samuel and Kings are put together as one, just one and two are together as one book. So the numbers are a little bit different. Um, let me get down to the bottom part here. Um, Chronicles is the same way. 
So the, the item of 39 may be a little bit different depending on what you, what you pick up. Uh, and then the, the poetry and wisdom section, which we're probably very familiar with, particularly Psalms, um, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. And then I thought it was very interesting, the major and the minor prophets had nothing to do with their status. <laughs> the major prophets are the ones that wrote the most. <laughs> and the minor prophets are the ones that didn't write more as much. So it's, it's not, it's not whether they were how it wasn't their status of how much, how big, how good a prophet they were or anything else. It was strictly just the length. Before I unshare any questions about this, you, anything you want to talk about in the, as far as the order and how it's organized? Well, I'll just comment. Yeah, you, you said it correctly, the Pentateuch, and that literally means the five scrolls. That's what Pentateuch means. And again, because, and, and, um, because of the major prophets, I mean, those scrolls were bigger than the other prophets. So that's why, that's another reason. Yes, they wrote a lot. So the scrolls were bigger. And, and people didn't carry around their Bible in their, in their back pocket uh, back then because uh, they didn't have printing presses, so they didn't have a way to do that. They had the scrolls, as you mentioned. Um, and only a few people were, were lucky enough to have a scroll or more. Most of them were just kept in the, kept in the temple by the, by the rabbis or the. Okay. Um, yeah. Scott. Go ahead. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that uh, the author, the, the writings weren't necessarily written in the same order that we see them. Um, do we know what is the actual chronology of the uh, various uh, either books or uh, chapters within the books and that sort of thing? Michael, you have any idea? Because I don't, I don't know from the readings. I think they're pretty much written um, in the order that's put through because the Bible was mostly written during the time of the exile. So they, they had all the information together. It was just a matter of putting it together now. Um, okay. It, it seems like, uh, Michael, I heard somewhere that Job is probably the most ancient yeah. of all of the writings um i'm not sure of that because there are certainly um some proverbs that might be older and uh. certainly and and job and the proverbs are wisdom literature along with ecclesiastes and some okay. of the psalms um I'll, I'll check that to find out um i tried to make the case that job was written during the time of the exile and writing a paper in uh, when i was at duke and it didn't go well. <laughs> okay. okay, well, and you had mentioned Proverbs. That is one of my favorite. It seems like it really belongs under the title of wisdom literature. Well, yes, it, it is. Yeah. Um, Quite a collection of uh, words to live by. Right. So in, the, in this Rose um, Bible, Bible maps and timelines. It's got a it's got a long timeline which includes um, what was happening historically as well as what's described in the Bible. And then it goes through each of the each of the sections, and sure enough, it's it's ascribing um, the Pentateuch all all five of the uh, chat all five of the books to Moses. Um, so I just thought that was interesting. And then it goes through, and there's a summary with some key verses and an outline of what's in there, including the time, the time frame that it, um, that it occurs and where, and where things occur. So it's a good, it's a good uh, little cheat sheet if you want to, uh, it's sort of the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> if you want to have a quick information about who it, Ezra was or, or when did that occur or any of the other things. And Ezra was um, listed as the author for some of the a half dozen of the books, as well as some of the ones that were unknown were also potentially ascribed to, to Ezra. Um, Samuel was, is shown here. 
again, I don't know how much to believe this, but that's what that's what they're saying. Um, and then uh, Psalms, we know that, that David wrote a lot, but there's a number of other people that were ascribed to providing some of the Psalms. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I find this very interesting as well. Um, I'm, I'm not as versed in the Old Testament, frankly. I mean, I read the read the first five, but I haven't read all of the rest of it, uh, I have to admit. So um, we'll... Uh, We'll find we'll find more opportunities to to study Old Testament. I, I usually concentrate on the New Testament since I sorry, grew up that way, uh, reading the New Testament more than the Old Testament. To be truthful, uh, Scott, I've got a question for you. Sure. Um, if Moses wrote it and uh, did the uh, Ten Commandments, how come he didn't write them in hieroglyphics? Because uh, being trained in Pharaoh's household, he would have probably been more likely <laughs> to know hieroglyphics. <laughs> or, in fact, are they in hieroglyphics? And we just don't know it. Um, well, I don't know. I, I personally haven't seen the, the uh, stone tablets. Have you? <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know. I haven't, but I know they're in a government warehouse somewhere. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> buried along with the other records. I saw a very interesting, I think it was a National Geographic um, thing on Egypt that um, showed the that there were some writings found in a cave somewhere on the Sinai Peninsula because of workers who had gone there to, to uh, mine a certain uh, ore for, for something or other. Uh, oh no, it wasn't that, it was on um, a Nova thing, that's right. But uh, with no, respect but... to writing, um, it, it kind of showed from that point how we got to our alphabet today. So with respect to writing um, during the time of Moses, um, I don't think a lot of things were, were put on papyrus yet. It was still clay tablets uh, or walls. Cuneiform. Cuneiform, right. Okay. But, oh. but it's interesting that our letter A, just to give you the shorthand, basically comes from the picture of a bull's head. But I, I recommend it to you. It's a PBS Nova on, on language, I think it's called. But, um, but they take the picture of a bull's head and they have it go through its very iterations um, through the, the Semitic uh, alf, Aleph, and then the, the Roman A, and, the, and the, the Greek A as well, Alpha. Looks like to me it would be upside down though, but I just well, that's right. a capital. That's right. But it, it got turned, it turned, it got turned upside down, right? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, uh, there's, there's so, it's so fascinating some of those things, how, th how that kind of thing came about. Um, I have trouble enough just doing doing it today, so I'm not sure I, how it would have been back then when you didn't have an alphabet yet, or how you had to try to write things down and get ideas. Pictographs obviously were one of the early forms of writing, mm -hmm. and we see that in a lot of uh, uh, here in this country. You'll see out here in the West. Um, you can if you go to um, Valley of Fire, for example, you'll mm -hmm. see cave cave uh, writings and. Um, trying to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And you'll also see the same things on in the um, in Egypt in, in the temples and things in the uh, where they've had a lot of those kind of um, carvings and things which were part of the stories they were trying to tell. Well in, in Mesopotamia for the the first aspects of writing were actually business transactions that needed to be recorded. And then after that they began to put down stories of, of, of their faith. PBS has an interest has an interesting um, presentations, two of them, one on the origins of writing and one on um, oh I forget what the other one is, but they're related. The one thing that they've identified is that the Asian writing, kanji, mm -hmm. is very much related to hieroglyphics 
And so, um, interestingly enough, um, some of what we st still see today comes from the ancient origins. It's Scott, I think Susan started to say something a couple times. Well, I sitting here thinking I would really appreciate it since we were talking about the Old Testament. If someone, this, this has bothered me for a long time, a question I wondered for a long time. Could someone tell me how the dating says, how they taught the years and stuff, how they recorded, who to say, well, this is 500, because this is, this, we'll call this year 2000 BC, BC or we'll call this uh, some, some year, how they knew to go backwards, how they, how, how did the time work? How does, who, who kept the time system? You had like BC, how would you know? May I respond? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> so you may or may, in, uh, in some dating, you might have seen the letters AD, and it stands for the Latin Anno Domini, Year of Our Lord. So the timing of splitting the, what we say the, the BC, or sometimes referred to as before Christ, or now BCE, before the Common Era, or CE, Common Era, um, it's basically the, marking the birth of Jesus in the year one. So everything after the birth now is, is uh, added toward as we go in the future, we, we increase the dates, whereas when we go backwards, we're increasing the dates in a negative way. Hey, who did I, think her point, uh, I think her point is, how do we know it happened in 500 BC or 12, 1100 yeah. BC or thereabouts, and who is recording how, what happened when? What, what is in there in history that recorded, even well, if they had some other way of, of referencing it? Well, in 1967, there was a, an archaeological find that, that finally confirmed that David was probably indeed a king because they found it, David, the, the house of David. Um, up until then, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure there was much archaeology, although there's been many attempts to use archaeology to prove the Bible. And of course, that was drummed into us that that doesn't necessarily work. But the, the one thing that, that can be dated accurately uh, are when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and they dated those pretty much back to the year 200 BC. So that gave a, um, a definite dating, so to speak, that could be done how scientists, however they do that. Now, up until that time, the oldest... A uh, document of the Old Testament was from the year 1000 AD. And so one thing that they did was they compared the Isaiah text from the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Isaiah text from the, the uh, what's called the Masoretic uh, Bible. And they found out that they're the same. And what that illustrates is that as people were recording scripture through the centuries, that they were doing a great job of remembering well what was going on in their history and then putting it down on papyrus and then and handing it on. I think um, most of the, the dating that happens goes from other, what, what are uh, in history, such as it is known when the Babylonians were in power, when the Assyrians were in power and they did things and, and you can read about these in the, in the Bible from, uh, First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. So that's kind of how they begin to tie things together. So, for example, and I think I think Adam might mention that in his book, but it's usually thought that David was reigning. He started his reign around the year 1000 um, BC. And what you would do then is begin to count back years to maybe try to place where Abraham and Moses and all of that were as well. 
most scholars believe that Abraham, and I think Adams mentioned this too, is around 1800 BC, because that seems to be a time when there was a lot of uh, wanderings of nomads throughout the, the deserts. Um, but there, there's always discoveries going on um, that I read about uh, of interesting things that are found um, to kind of show and by, by um, oh, what's the word? Providence, provi Providence, Providence, uh, being able to prove based on where it is in the, in the dirt, so to speak, because there's all kinds of stratus of dirt, the timeline about something was written. So if an example, if they find a piece of papyrus that's been buried down 100 feet in the ground, they might be able to date that pretty well to maybe the year 1000 BC, just because of the, the depth it was in the ground. I don't know if that's helpful or not, if I need to clarify. So the Bible timeline that I've got in this Rose book, which I don't, I won't, you won't be able to read it, but I'll just show it, show you what it looks like. Can you, is that seeable? No, your, your virtual background. The background is messing it up. Okay. Um, in any case, um, it's, it's got, Bible history, world history, and Middle East history going on three lines across the top. And it's similar to what is in Making Sense of the Bible um, in the timeline that, that is showing uh, the beginning of the chapter here. Events described in the Bible and world events and empires. So that's one of the ways that they're trying to date the Bible with what else was going on at the same time. And information in the Bible with, inf with historical information that they've been able to pick up of what was going on with the different empires and the different times from that. So, uh, but this is very detailed, it's very interesting. So if you um, have access to that or you can get that on the internet, um, you might want to look at that because there's a really um, interesting correlation between the, th the things that are, are being discussed. I did want to move on. We only have another 15 minutes. Well, if I, if I can just say, I just remembered another great example. If you remember, King Hez when King Hezekiah was king of Judah, the Assyrians surrounded Jerusalem. That's in the Bible. And um, the, the king of Assyria could not defeat. And that's what eventually caused a little bit of pride to get out of control. But in, in the... Uh, the annals of the Assyrian kings, it is written that that king went and conquered all of Judah and then put and then uh, surrounded Hezekiah like a bird in a bird cage. So that document from the Assyrians can be dated. And then you can look in the Bible and see where that happens in the Bible. And that will give you an idea then where that was taking place in history. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Sure. In other words, the historians, some point along the line, some, like in the last couple hundred years, if you, I, mean, I don't know how many years, but sometimes historians sat down and, and figured out, well, this is, this is how, when it happened and before Christ. And they, some, they, did, they didn't do the BC and figure out the timeline until after, way, way, until just fairly recently. Is that what you're saying? Well, a lot of this stuff started happening because of what's known as the Enlightenment, when uh, <coughs> the scientific method was being used to explain the world as we know it. And, and those um, um, tools used to do that were applied to the Bible as well. And plus, uh, again, by looking at other um, uh, nations like Assyria and Babylon, um, oh gosh, what's the other one? Well, Egypt too, um, gives a sense on, on how old it is. Like I said, the, the, it's the, really the birth of Jesus marks the, the point between the two eras, if, let's call them that, the era before Christ and the era after Christ. And, and that's, it, that's in our... Um, Christian-oriented culture, but as we right. think about Islam, they have a different a different timeline, and so do the Jewish people. 
So thank you. Don't don't the Chinese have a different timeline too? I don't know. I would expect they do. Okay. I, would, I would expect it's only it's only because of um, what happened with um, with the Catholic Church basically and starting to date things and starting to get things organized and the Catholic religion was the predominant religion for the for Christianity um, that they started getting getting those things organized and it was the priests and those that were doing all that work. Um, and then, of course, the priests that um, that figured out when when year one was actually got it wrong, and year one is minus four or so. Yeah, around um, it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, but close enough, right? Didn't want to go back and change all the calendars again after after doing that. So uh, I I want to do one more thing. We 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 attempted to cover in this section um, eighteen. I'll take that back. This section, it's it's seven, seven chapters out of this book. So um, we didn't expect to cover it well in a full hour. I just wanted to touch the surface and get get the get a few key thoughts down and discuss. Um, we could we could spend we could spend a a, a, um, a session or more on each of those topics. So if you have the book. See, and you haven't read those yet, yet you might want to go back and do that um, or or do some other research if you're interested in more more information. I do want to talk about Jesus and the Old Testament. Uh, I let off that with a little introduction to that. Um, and there's a, a passage here that, that I want to read. And this is in Luke chapter 2, starting with uh, 42. When he was 12 years old, and they went to the festival according to custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Did you, didn't you know I had to be with my father's house? but they did not understand what he was saying to them. And then there's uh, many, many different parts of the New Testament that, that Jesus was quoting Old Testament scripture. Um, but this tells you at an early age, similar to what Adam talked about at an early age, he had a, he knew, <laughs> he knew what his, what his, uh, what his role was and what it had, what it, what it would be. Um, and he started telling people, I don't know what happened. We don't know how much, we don't have any information really what happened since age, from age 12 to age 30, um, other than a, a few little quips here and there, but we just don't have much. Um, we do know that he was, he was a student of the, it wasn't the Old Testament then, it was the Testament. He was a student of the Torah. He was a student of, of the other, other books of the Bible. Uh, the, of what we call now the Old Testament, or the Jewish Bible, because that's all they had. And there were scrolls, but there weren't a lot of them. He probably didn't, they, being they weren't well to do, they did probably didn't own any, but they were available, I guess, in the local synagogue or the local somewhere that he was able to read and study, or they go to Jerusalem and um, on their annual annual trek to Jerusalem, and he'd, he'd be studying. Was uh, this a rabbi? Excuse me. Wasn't Jesus a rabbi? It, it's possible he was a rabbi. Some people even think he might have been a Pharisee. Yeah, they call him rabbi, but rabbi, what does rabbi mean? That's what I was going to say. What do you do to become a rabbi? Yes. We have to learn, but at age 12 is the age of the, the bar mitzvah. 
where yeah. he became the age of reason. literally the son of the commandment. So that's probably what, you know, Jesus at age 12 is going through that. And he would have been instructed in the scriptures just like any Jewish boy. I think that rabbi just simply means teacher. Exactly. When they're referring to Jesus as rabbi, they were just saying teacher. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's that's the point I was making, Susan. Thank you. Um, that's that, and so that's why they they do call him rabbi. Uh -oh. But what he, there was no there was no degree program or certification program by the local board of education to say you are now certified as a teacher and allowed to teach in the public school. Um, they didn't really have a public school and they didn't have a certification program. They didn't have any of that bureaucracy. So people studied on their own by, by listening to others and, and reading what they could and um, mainly a lot of oral tradition. And when then they got good enough, they would out to go out and start telling this, telling, re, retelling the stories, uh, retelling the lore. And if they were good enough at it, they were called a teacher. Mm -hmm. And then uh -huh. Paul would have been probably the most educated of that group because it's recorded that he actually went to the rabbinical school taught by uh, Gamaliel. And that was one of the, still one of the most well thought of uh, rabbinical teachings. So uh, he had a, a, a heads up there right. on the others. Right. Okay. So it's now a couple minutes before 10. I do want to quit at 10 o'clock. Um, I do have some music to play at the end. Um, but I do want to close with a prayer. I want to talk about next week. We'll do the New Testament. There's a lot of material there again in the book. Um, and so, or you can go online. Unfortunately, this being this was done in 2014, I couldn't find all of the sermons that go with the, all the first parts of this book, the Old and the New Testament. It's more the sermons that I sent out and the information I sent out was more towards the second half of the book making sense of the difficult passages of the Bible. Um, but go, go through ne for next week and look, if you don't have the book and you can't read those, those um, uh, seven chapters, six chapters, um, look, at, look through your New Testament, look for areas that you're, you're question, you wanna talk about, and um, we'll have a discussion again about how the New Testament came about. Um, we'll talk about the, um, uh, how how they, they became into got into the Bible, what the timeline was as far as what got done when we've talked about that a lot, um, but we'll talk about that as well, um, and just just sort of familiarize yourself with the, the Old Testament. And again, if you have specific areas you want to discuss, uh, that's the purpose of this discussion. It's to it's to whet your appetite for more further further Bible reading, but further Bible study, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll close with a prayer and then we'll go into the music. We thank you, O Holy One, for the most wonderful words of life. Guide us in the coming days as we continue to explore what your word meant to the ancient communities as, as, it, was to, as it was addressed to Jesus and to the early church. Most of all, by your spirit, guide us together as we seek to discern what your word means to us for today and what you would have us here today. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So in, in um, some of us have an 1130, we have uh, church. Michael, are you still on? Do you want to just skip? you want to talk a little about what your sermon is today? Well, it, it's, uh, we're, we're closing toward the end of the Christian year, so it's important to be ready. <laughs> For Jesus. So it's the, the story, the parable of the five foolish maids or bridesmaids and the five wise bridesmaids and who has the oil and who doesn't have the oil. So, so that's what's happening. Unfortunately, I think the sound quality is not good again and we're working toward that, but hopefully you'll be able to make out there's just a hissing sound that keeps happening. That's the problem with audio. Yeah, I, I, Good audio engineers are um, are hard to find because there are so many little bugs that creep up in audio and video production. Um, okay, so 
again, thank you very much. And we'll see. Uh, hold on. Hold oh, on. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, if you haven't checked the chat uh, from Terry, morning, everyone. I'm leaving early, just not feeling just right. Uh, have a blessed week, mm -hmm. Terry. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure everybody checks the, the chat. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, and I did see that. But thank yeah. you for pointing that out. And Linda, okay. said he had to go someplace. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and and obviously uh, this will be this is recorded. If you miss part of it, or you you have friends that might want to see it, all of our all of our um, services and all of our Bible studies are up on on the YouTube channel Boulder City United Methodist Church. So um, that's available. And what I what I found for to today for on for music. If I can find where it is. Okay, here we go. Um, so I was trying to find something that was interesting that was be, I, cause I, I searched <laughs> YouTube great hymns of the Old Testament and had a little problem finding anything that came up with that search, but I did find something I thought was really interesting. So it's, it is, and I want to make this bigger so you can see it. It was the Psalms put to music in order of the Psalms. So does anyone have a favorite one they would like to hear? I've got a couple that I've, I've already listened to, but is, does somebody have a favorite Psalm that they would like to see how it was put to music? All right, hearing none, I listened to Psalm 24 and I thought it was kind of neat. Um, so I will play that one. And then the other one I listened to was Psalm, uh, I think it was 130. And I'll play that. So I'll play two songs and then um, I'll leave it up to you to do your own searches and find your own music that inspires you. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, thanks, thanks, everyone. Scott.